I'm Chung, I'm partner of Basis Set. We are a seed fund investing in AI and automation with a bit over 300 million AUM. A big part of BSV is cultivating communities. And we are bringing together a few communities today. Dev Founders is a community for founders of developer tools and infrastructure companies. Persistence is a community of women execs and founders in tech. And we're really excited to have a great room here. So first, um, I'm going to share a few exciting events that we have coming up. And Lisa will post the links to RSVP to those events in the chat. So tomorrow we have a self-awareness workshop led by Jenny He, who is the founder and CEO of Ergion. In a short four years, she has built um, a global company of over 400 people. And she, she gives a great training to her managers on self-awareness and, uh, and it's just a great workshop. And then in, in a, uh, early August, uh, we have a workshop called from engineer one to 50, how to hire and grow your engineering team from in seed A and beyond. And this is led by Ninian, who is who was formerly the VP Eng at Niantic. And, uh, and she previously was a founder um, at startups and now she's on the board and advisors in a number of different startups. And I think that's also pretty interesting. And finally, uh, late August, we have a, a workshop called the Managing the Emotional Roller Coaster of Running Your Company. Um, which is a topic near and dear to my heart, talking about all the, just, you know, uh, the, the, the real parts uh, of being a founder. But last but not the least, today we have Marketing for Developers Workshop led by Krithika. Krithika is a head of marketing at Retool. Previously, she was the first marketer at Stripe and spent eight and a half years at Stripe. And for the first three years, she was the only marketer at Stripe. So if there's anybody in tech who knows how it's done, in developer marketing, it is Krithika. We're so excited to have her here today. And Krithika, take it away. Uh, thank you, Chang, for the kind words. And uh, thanks, Basis Set, for hosting this event. And it's so nice to see some familiar faces and, and new folks who I haven't met before. So uh, I'm going to be sharing some of my learnings from my time at Stripe and uh, previously to that Dropbox and Google. And now I'm at, at Retool. So I've been at Retool for about three months now. So it's still very early for me. but. Uh, I think there's a, a lot that we can talk through. The, the thing with most of these talks is that they tend to be one super fluffy or like high level when people share insights and advice for folks. I've tried to make this talk as tactical as possible and we'll go through a lot of examples, not just examples of work that I've done, but also examples from folks who are doing it really well around the internet. The, the second thing that happens with talks like this is that people tend to give advice as if it's sort of wholesale applicable to anyone and everyone. And I think one of the most critical things to keep in mind is that it isn't. Um, you know, most developer marketing or most good marketing means that you really, really understand your customers. Even you know, saying developer marketing is kind of hard because they're not a monolithic audience. There's so many different ways to segment that audience. And you also really need to understand your customer and buying journey and the macro environment in which you're operating in, whether that is uh, the competitive landscape, whether it's new trends or shifts in the market. And so sort of don't take any of my experiences as advice that you need to go and apply, but rather as frameworks for thinking about how to uh, tackle the problem. So with that said, a quick introduction on myself. As I mentioned, uh, I have a little bit of a different background than most marketers in that I was an engineer before I was a marketer. And so I started off my career as a front-end developer at Google and ended up making my way into doing marketing for the Android platform. I was the third person in marketing at Dropbox and, and helped them launch the Dropbox platform for the very first time. And then I was the first person in marketing at Stripe. And as Chang mentioned, was there for about eight and a half years before I made the switch and the leap to Retool, where I now head up marketing. So when I say that I'm the first marketer at Stripe, it's a little bit of a misnomer because truly the first marketers at Stripe were our founders, Patrick and John. And you know, Stripe didn't know too much about marketing when they first started out, but I think they had all of the right instincts in terms of engineers speaking to engineers. And you know, Patrick and John launched their company with just a post on Hacker News and a tweet. And, and so as I, as I mentioned, you know, what worked for Stripe probably won't work for you because there's a, a lot of things that really implicated uh, the, the way that we operated, including things like a strong inbound funnel, developer awareness, and so on. It's also a little bit of a caveat of where in the kind of programming stack Stripe operated. You know, if you're a business doing business on the internet, you need payments. So Stripe becomes sort of a non-optional purchase versus for many of us now, we're working with products where it may be an option for a developer to build something from scratch, 
uh, or to choose a completely different platform to build on. So all of those factors really kind of play into uh, the lens with which you should be listening to this talk. Um, the final thing is a lot of these companies that do great marketing to developers seem amazing on the outside, uh, but it's still kind of derpy on the inside. Like there's a lot to figure out still. Uh, and a lot of that playbook is still being written. Okay, so let's get into it. So the traditional self-serve funnel looks something like this, right? The biggest lie about this diagram is that these boxes are all equally important. This is truly what it, what it actually is, is an optimization problem. You're optimizing to a local maximum. But there are plenty of counterexamples. You know, for example, AWS is an amazing product and a terrible funnel. So lots of mediocre businesses have optimized this funnel a lot, but not had the results that they would expect. When it comes to the sales side of the house, this is traditionally how you're meant to set it up, right? Like a nice sort of linear handoff between marketing and sales uh, to a sort of a development rep and an account executive and a customer success manager who helps with the deployment. But again, that's not really how it works these days for technical products, especially API driven ones or ones with a lot of flexibility in how they're used, which is absolutely the case for both Stripe and for Retool. Instead, what it actually looks like is something like this, right? There's a bunch of different touch points and then there's AEs who take full ownership over the account, depending on the size of the business. So I'll talk a little bit more about org design in, in, later on in the talk. But with this in mind, what I would like to focus on are some of these touch points and especially how to think about them with a developer or a technical audience focus. Many of you are founders who are working on developer products. Many of you are developers yourselves. So you probably have a lot of the right instincts, but Sometimes the industry tries to wear down those instincts with playbooks and sort of best practices. And so I'm here to kind of instill, uh, to go back to those instincts when it comes to talking to developers. All right, so when it comes to reaching developers, a quick show of hands, or maybe just like post it in the chat. How many of you have done business in Japan? Okay. A little bit. So maybe some of you have a little bit of experience. Great. Uh, it's a very different culture, right? It's, it's quite hierarchical. There's a lot of politeness and sort of uh, the repertoire around that. There's some conservatism, career orientation. This is a perfectly normal thing that you would do when you launch Stripe in Japan, um, a three-way handshake. Uh, maybe seems a little strange, but very par for the course when you're doing business in Japan. To just kind of say, hey, here's the day that I'm gonna have free while we're waiting on things. I think between that, do you feel developer marketing is, is somewhat similar, right? We'll talk about a few of the playbooks in particular, but the first thing to understand is that there is a distinctive culture. You know, outbound tactics are very poorly received. Uh, they're not scared of technical integration work. They're very skeptical of lock-in. They hate unsolicited emails. And yeah, the culture is different and distinct. The pitfall is sometimes when you try to do developer marketing, you can sort of end up like this, where uh, you may throw it throw on efforts that actually actively hurt, right? Someone outside of the culture trying to guess what will go over well with the folks inside of the culture and sort of no code and loving functions. I don't love functions with nonsensical arguments and probably neither do any other developers. So this is sort of like sitting in the wrong seat at the conference table in Japan. Developers really can't see past small errors. This is uh, so this code, as you might see on the page, isn't going to run. And for some of you in the audience, it's going to obviously not run. Um, and again, that applies to your marketing in important ways, right? Writing, documentation. Many people lose before they're even started because they don't pay attention to how they're marketing and instead spend all of their time and energy on the product. Um, but marketing is really the first touch point that you have with your developers and your audience. And it's really important to get that right as well. So what actually does work for reaching developers? Uh, during the consideration phase, it's incredibly important to show the product and what it does. Second, um, so now at Retool, you know, we're building developer tools and we might be building things that get pretty abstract. And so it's really important to make that as tangible as possible. And then lower down in the funnel, if you do try to do sales to a developer, it has to look and smell and act a little bit differently. So I'm gonna get into all of these three things. So first, in, in showing the product, um, one of the, the companies that does this really well these days is Vercel. Uh, they recently did a, uh, an update to their homepage and um, developers just wanna know what your product does and how it works. You know, just show me the damn product. And so Vercel does this quite well on their homepage. They preview the experience and they kind of go step-by-step step into what it's gonna feel like 
uh, to use their product very early in the funnel. Uh, actually, if I can get this right, I'll just show you all what it looks like today. So you can see right in the in in uh, the, the home page, they're getting into actually what it might look like to make the changes that apply uh, directly to the website. And kind of continuing down to the rest of the flow, they're still showing you directly how that experience might look and feel. So I personally think this is a fantastic example. This is one of the reasons why we chose to make the docs available on Stripe without a sign up. Uh, obviously, this is fairly common practice now, but actually when we first started out, I'm kind of baffled by the number of developer tools that required you to contact sales before you'd get access to the API. Uh, and so, you know, most B2B buyers kind of exist in PowerPoint land, like they expect to talk to a salesperson, but most developers exist in code land, like their demo is actually playing around with the product. So to the extent that you can make that possible, it's really, really important. Uh, I'm not going to touch on all of the developer ergonomics that we invested in, you know, things like sample code, auto-generating code, uh, dark mode, et cetera, but I just want to underscore what it means to demo an API. Now let's go into making the abstract tangible. What do I mean by this? So good product marketing, it shows how the product actually works and it's good for all type of buyers, not just for developers. Um, so here is an example from the Nexmo website uh, for their SMS API. Um, and as a contrast, here's the, the look from the Twilio website. They're doing kind of exactly the same thing. The Twilio website, however, is kind of showing exactly the flow that happens, with, which helps the buyers understand the flow in a more tangible way. Um, you know, it feels like it's just a design decision here to do something abstract or detailed here, but I'd argue that one is much more better suited to developers. Similarly for Stride Billing, when we launched that a couple of years ago, uh, we, go, we went as far as showing some of the architectural flows as well as the code right on the marketing page. It, the most straightforward way to get across the simplicity of the APIs to developers is to show them how it works instead of just telling them it's simple. So the sort of adage of show, don't tell definitely applies in developer marketing. Uh, you know, with B2B marketing, it's often easy to get really enterprisey and vague in your descriptions, but it's actually often more important to clarify with the words that you end up using. Like use a strong active voice and just explain as you would to a technical friend over a lunch or a dinner. Uh, people are surprisingly bad at writing copy. You know, oftentimes it can just end up looking like enterprise word soup. Um, this is a, a lovely tool called Corporate Ipsum that just generates generates this stuff. You know, people really find reasons, weirdly enough, to not talk about what the product does. You, you may sometimes go to a marketing class and they tell you you need to be in benefits, not features. Just cut this out of your life if you're marketing to developers because. If you want to really get across what your product does, just tell them what the product does. Sounds simple enough, but it's really, really hard to get right. One potential tip for you all, if uh, you're trying to do this show, not tell, is to beta test your marketing. Um, you know, get some engineers to look over any marketing collateral that you create, and they'll tell you what's off. They'll tell you what does or doesn't make sense and what is confusing. And that beta testing of the marketing can be super, super helpful in uh, ensuring that folks are actually uh, getting what you want to get out of the marketing page. Okay. Again, don't get into this trap, right? Like use those engineers to tell you exactly what you're getting right and what you're not getting right. If, uh, if something sounds derpy, uh, the engineer you're beta testing with will tell you. As I said, I'll, I wanted to get into some tangible examples. So here is the homepage of Mux. Um, my friends at Mux, they just make it much, very, very easy to understand the value prop and why you should care about Mux without necessarily needing to talk to someone to understand it. And again, the code is right on the page to get you a sense of what it will take to implement. Uh, here's another example from Linear. Uh, Linear does a fantastic more visual job of showing what the experience is going to be like. Um, and so that's another one that I really love to, to call out to. They also do these small little video animations to showcase the product. So again, show don't tell uh, really comes to life on the Linear website. At Retool, uh, we have a bunch of these template pages that you can explore. 
Uh, one of them has a live demo that you can, actually many of them have a live demo that you can click into and try out before even signing up for an account. And now again, that might seem a little bit counterintuitive based on what marketing advice you've been given, which is always collect the lead, always collect the email address. But actually, if you just give developers a little bit of slack and leeway to try out your product, um, it is actually much more useful and they're much more likely to give you an email address much later on. So if you think about optimizing that funnel, if you have a lot of people at the top of the funnel, but you have a huge drop-off point once they actually sign up or convert, you may actually be optimizing in the wrong way. You may want a smaller pool at the top of the funnel, but a much larger conversion down the road. So again, a counterintuitive example, but actually don't pray in, play into the trap of needing to collect an email address at all times because Developers will either put in fake email addresses, throw away email addresses, or unsubscribe as soon as you start putting them into a drip campaign. That's not really the place where you wanna be. I also mentioned this idea, of it's very easy to get into this corporate Ipsum or enterprise word suit. Uh, this is an example, I won't name the company, but you know, they have this watch how it works video. But as you get into it, it's like, if you can read the caption here, you use APIs and smart thinking instead of hard code and heavy lifting. I'm not entirely sure the buyer here is, is meant to be a developer because that's not something that would resonate. You'd much rather wanna get into the specific details uh, right there. So talk up to your audience rather than talking down to potentially a lowest common denominator. And as I said, talk as you would to a human, right? Be straight and don't shy away from touching on some of the more interesting things that are happening in the zeitgeist. You know, by now you've, uh, so this was an uh, announcement that we did for uh, when Heartbleed came out uh, and there was a pretty large vulnerability. You know, this is something where the copy and the content really was really important in terms of how we communicated with our customers and how Stripe was addressing the issue. Um, I'll share some links to these in the chat after we get into our Q&A. Okay, so that's how you make the abstract tangible. Now, for many of us, we are working on products where there is a strong self-serve funnel where you know, a developer may never need to talk to someone at the company before they get started with the product. But there might also be a strong sold funnel where uh, you are doing GTM and, and sales uh, motions. And so when you do need to reach out and get people interested in your product, how do you do that with developers more specifically? Well, Outbound really doesn't work with developers. It might work with teams or developer managers, engineering managers, but not to IC developers in my experience. When, it, when a developer is purchasing your product higher up in the funnel, it's much more about fostering a connection with your product and brand. Uh, we believe that it's important to create trust well before the decision-making process. It's one of the reasons why we invest in a strong content uh, strategy at Retool and a content program at Retool, because it's, it's much more non-transactional. We're not trying to get someone to sign up based on the content, it's just helpful content out there. Awareness is really the thing to focus on, not demand. So let's get into and unpack what that actually means. So now this is an interesting one. Um, I advise the, the folks over at Ambassador Labs and they help maintain this extremely popular open source tool called Telepresence. It's available for free to any developer, um, but Ambassador Cloud is the best in class flavor of that implementation with SLAs, integration specialists, and it's available for the dev teams that opt in. So contributing to open source can also help build trust because um, you're part of the system, right? You are giving back to the community. And so with developers, it's sort of putting the cart before the horse to just go in and start selling. You have to showcase that value first. It is also much more authentic when developers are talking to developers. So sort of in my tail end at Stripe, one of the uh, investments that we made was in a community experts program. So we brought in developers who were speaking about Stripe to their communities, gave them uh, previews in our betas. We took in a lot more feedback from them and helped kind of co-write some of the product roadmap alongside them. And it's a great place to just sort of geek out, right? It's a great place for feedback, of course. You know, Retool has hundreds of shared Slack channels with our customers, which is a fantastic way to get high bandwidth feedback. It's really hard to scale, but to the extent that you can, uh, do it until you hit the maximum boundaries of scaling, like keeping those open channels with developers is fantastic. Um, here you can see sort of folks in the Stripe community geeking out about live stream gear and so on, but that investment really pays off, right? When we launched Stripe payment links, 
the day we launched it, some of our community members also put out amazing content and tutorials about that product and feature. Uh, and so that's obviously a lot more authentic when it's coming not just from Stripe yelling about Stripe, but from developers talking to other developers. I'll also say you should uh, cultivate your influencers, right? Like you should share your roadmaps, hear their feedback, reward their time. Um, and so they, they end up having a long play effect. It might not be an immediate conversion event, but you will see this paying off dividends in the future. Um, Vasindra, who's on the call right now, actually ended up setting up a great relationship with uh, one of our uh, influencers, Corey Quinn uh, at Retool, who is uh, unabashedly a fan of Retool, but he's also unabashed about giving us very strong feedback about the things that, we, that he thinks we should be getting right. All right, and then lower in the funnel, once the sales team is engaged, selling to developers ends up looking a lot different than traditional sort of B2B sales. Uh, it ends up looking a lot more deeply technical. It's highly consultative and customized. It feels like talking and whiteboarding with a technical peer. And um, you know, at Stripe, we had this with our sales team uh, just joining up with engineers in the early days. And then we had solutions architects by the end of the time that I was there. And Retool has a very large team of deployed engineers who works alongside our prospects teams and helps them build their apps directly. Uh, and so that can be a huge way to, to move this stuff forward. Similarly, some of our larger accounts, we sent over engineers from Stripe to help those teams actually architect their integration and figure out how best to represent the APIs in, in their business model. And it can be sometimes as easy as setting up a shared channel, but uh, sometimes it's useful to actually get into a room and whiteboard. Okay, um, a few final thoughts, because I wanted to save a lot of room for questions. When it comes to reaching developers, doing sort of the expected thing is often not going to drive the results that you want. And sort of doing the same playbook as another company is going to be the same thing, because developers really appreciate novelty. Uh, and so you have to kind of invest in a mix of scalable and unscalable things to really invest in the audience. So a few years back at Stripe, we hosted what we dubbed the open source retreat. And uh, this is a, actually, we just invited some open source developers to come in and work in the Stripe offices. And we gave them a stipend for a period of three months. This stemmed from an insight that most OSS developers were mentioning that the biggest barrier to them contributing more to OSS was time and the ability to have unrestricted time to just focus on that project. Because many of them were doing it in nights and weekends. And again, it's sort of, unclear like why Stripe should have invested in this because we're a payments company you know maybe we should have done something in the payments and monetary space but we decided to do something that was more altruistic to developers and uh, thinking about the larger community it proved to be tremendously effective both in terms of the amount of interest that we got and sort of the output that we saw uh, and actually a bunch of different companies were inspired to to go and run their own open source retreat if you just get your teams going after like a named account list or a tight list of leads, you don't take some of these bigger chances that might have outsized impact. Um, you know, some non-buyers might be folks like investors or your employees or developers that may never use your product, um, the press and, and much more. So one of the ones that happened a, a few years ago that I really loved was Cloudflare's 1.1.1.1 campaign. Uh, they're not driving leads or signups for Cloudflare here. They're just offering a service for people. And ostensibly, though, it gets people who might not otherwise think about Cloudflare thinking about them. Um, this one is a screenshot of the Capture the Flag tournament that we ran at Stripe. There's no overt Stripe branding here, and the levels were pretty challenging and fun. Um, and there was no real prize either. We just had a t-shirt and bragging rights, um, but we had over 15,000 developers uh, participate the last time that we ran it and went all the way through all of the different levels. The point again is that you need to try a few things that haven't been done before. And if this feels tough, just sort of steal liberally from other domains or disciplines. Like don't look at your direct competitors, look outside of your field. Like, we didn't invest, invent CTFs at Stripe. Like this was very popular in the security community for years, but we just sort of stole and applied it to our domain. And um, that's a fun way to engage developers for sure. One thing before I step off the CTF train, uh, a lot of our early engineers were actually folks who finished all of the levels of CTF. Um, they decided to apply to Stripe because they were so struck by that, uh, that ex uh, 
that experience. Okay, so that's all well and good when it comes to developer marketing, but what about driving revenue when it comes to a developer product? So here's what I've learned so far in terms of scaling up teams when it comes to a developer domain. Honest metrics are really hard. I'm sorry, I don't have any silver bullets or answers for you all. Uh, it is really hard for any business that doesn't just sign fixed dollar contracts. You know, if you're NetSuite selling ERPs, it may be super easy. Um, the first year that Stripe set company level metrics was actually just in 2018. Uh, each of the team tracks sort of what was most useful to them. And as long as their output sort of ladders up to the company level goals. So on the sales team, for example, um, we had two types of metrics, seed metrics and harvest metrics. And that was primarily so that the sales team didn't over-optimize for short-term deal making. It's slightly different by stage of company. So for example, with startups, we cared about activations and net processing volume. And for larger companies, we were uh, caring much more about the pure revenue signed. The marketing metrics that we set actually ended up being fairly down funnel, which aligns both the marketing and sales teams really, really closely. Um, you know, the PMMs at Stripe track product metrics rather than just vanity metrics like page views at, at launch. Uh, at Retool, we're doing the same thing. Some of the new product launches that we have coming up, we're actually tracking to activated accounts that are actively building in the product rather than just how many views did we drive to the landing page. So what you measure, what you, uh, measure really matters. So set your uh, metrics accordingly. That leads me to the next point, which is at scale, marketing is just much more than just launching things. You know, this is really important because as you scale, like jumping from launch to launch is no longer going to get you sustained, predictable growth. You know, trending on Hacker News is a great goal, but it can't be the only source of spiky traffic that you get. So you have to build and ensure that there's more ongoing engagement with your customers. There's sort of three buckets of work that we've identified when it comes to marketing uh, and specifically product marketing in this case. One is market sizing and user research to feed into product development so that you go to market with the right thing in the first place. Second is the actual go to market. So packaging, pricing, never forget pricing. Pricing is a huge lever when it comes to developer marketing. Uh, naming, thinking about collateral for self-serve, collateral for sales, uh, et cetera. And finally, the bucket that's sort of often forgotten is the post-launch work to ensure ongoing engagement and growth for your product. Kind of what we end up with uh, when we do marketing is that the analogy is something like a professor in college who thinks theirs is the only class that you're taking. But the reality is developers and most people these days are bombarded with offers and announcements and news all day long. Like no one's sitting on your blog waiting for you to drop your next feature and then have a, a team and a developers ready for their next sprint to go and integrate that feature. So you have to think about contextual ways to surface the right feature at the right time. Uh, Cause it's almost a like cohort base. Every new cohort of companies that is coming through may have at a different stage of their company, a need for your product or feature. So just bake that in because your launch moment isn't the only time that you may need to surface that feature. All right. So beta test your marketing. I mentioned this, that as you start scaling, try to get that user feedback at scale. The informal version of this is just sending a screenshot to friends that you respect. And you know, if they say something like, I don't understand what this does, as they often will, you should pause and iterate. Um, one quick note here is that the folks that are beta testing your product experience may not be the, the folks that you are the target audience for beta testing your marketing. Your decision makers, your buyers may be different between those two. Um, if you have different decision makers versus practitioners, you need to kind of change accordingly to who you are beta testing your marketing to. And I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I mentioned that you should throw away the playbooks, but I would recommend studying the playbooks and take and apply what uh, is useful to your companies. A lot of these traditional marketing tactics get a bad rap, especially amongst developer communities, because people over index to the really bad stuff that they've seen. Um, you should be following the good versions of the marketing tactics you've seen instead. Um, you know, events kind of get a bad rap for being schmoozy and salesy. Here's another great example from Mux. They've created the conference for video professionals called DMUX. And it's less about Mux and much more about creating a community where there wasn't one before. So that has been a fantastic driver for them. Uh, Retool recently attended the Snowflake Summit 
And you know, our buyers are extremely technical. So we optimized our time at our booth to show really, really deep demos. We actually did custom demos for every person who came by. And you know, we didn't scan as many leads, but the conversations were deeper and they accelerated the sales pipeline considerably. Another thing that gets a bad rap, outbound emails. And again, it's probably because you're over-indexing to the terrible ones. If you're clever, interesting, providing useful information, these can actually convert quite well. Email is still, uh, has a high ceiling and headroom for you to optimize into. Content, content marketing, you know, again, the world is sort of littered with listicles and shallow content. So to get to the purpose of the content, it's just like picture a funnel, right? You want to develop the relationship before the buying moment shows up. So when done well, like digital oceans, community guides, content can be fantastic for scaling your reach. And um, I, I think the last time I talked to the folks at DO, they were getting 2 million uniques a month um, on just their content library. That can be a huge, huge driver of, of traffic. And sometimes you need to do content for the sake of it. Like here's a fantastic example from Retool, uh, which just explained what the heck Salesforce is to technical folks. And um, this wasn't specifically about selling Retool at all. Um, and it was just much more to build relationships with developers and you know, maybe down the line when they have an interest in internal tools or building an application, they may consider Retool, but it wasn't transactional in that way. There really is no Band-Aid for lack of product market fit. So, as long as you have product market fit, you can experiment a lot with your marketing and collateral. Um, finally, my approach is that you often can't control industry shifts, but you can turn them into opportunities. A couple of years ago at Stripe, um, there was a, a broad set of mandates that came out called PSD2. These really define sort of online security and authentication for payments. And it impacted a lot of uh, ways that marketplaces and customers had to operate when they were doing business on the internet. So Stripe came to market first with a, a great and useful guide to how uh, businesses should decipher PSD2, what actions they needed to take. And in general, you can sort of take a look at industry events, regulatory changes, new laws, and use them as great opportunities to build content and embrace that change that happens in the industry. So as I said, for usage-based products, your go-to-market org will probably look different than the traditional B2B mix. Your metrics will look different too, so be really mindful of them. And yeah, you should probably be doing some things at scale that are the good versions of the bad playbooks. <laughs> and so that's uh, that's the end of my prepared content, but yeah, I'm happy to take any questions or, or thoughts. And I'm sure many of you are facing similar challenges or have some learnings from doing developer marketing yourself. So would love for you all to share that with the, the rest of the crew here. Yeah, given how many people we have here, let's put questions in the chat. And then so that when we have multiple similar questions, we uh, quickly then can tackle them together. And let's all turn on the videos here so that we can see everyone's merry faces. Great, Vivek has a question. I think this is a great question. Um, I think founders can end up doing a lot of the marketing for a very long amount of time because you have a deep, deep understanding of the customer. Uh, and so to the extent that you can put out authentic information about your learnings or guides or tips for people to tackle the domain space that your product or company is tackling, that can be very, very helpful. Um, my friends at MKT1 ended up putting out a fantastic article about um, hiring your SaaS marketing organization. This applies very largely for developer marketing. So find T-shaped or pie-shaped marketers as the article says. So I just put that link in the chat. They do a great, much better job explaining it than I ever will. All right, Trent, should I tackle the next one? Yeah, just go ahead. All right, so uh, in terms of hiring and uh, tech building philosophy, uh, I think, listen, there are, I think uh, a lot of this is going to be around finding people from sort of maybe different backgrounds. Like personally, I'm a developer turned marketer. There are a ton of people who actually came in from um, like consulting backgrounds who did fantastically at Stripe. 
Uh, we also had PMs turned PMMs. Like those kinds of jumps are actually quite useful for a nascent field like developer marketing. In terms of the tech stack, you want to have tech that enables really um, thoughtful marketing that doesn't overtly feel like marketing. So even things like how UTM parameters show up or is it plain text versus HTML text? These things can really matter. So um, I'm personally not a fan of our chat bot on our website, but that's a, a, that's a battle to come. <laughs> really much more about diagnosis. You almost want to diagnose what's going on with the company and early marketing may seem more like growth product management because you are uh, maybe just iterating on your funnel. Maybe you're throwing up some landing pages and fake ads on uh, Facebook or LinkedIn just to see what type of messaging do people respond to. So it can look a lot more uh, explorative, experimental, um, and it doesn't have to be sort of the direct playbook of launching new products, launching new features, and uh, starting to scale demand gen. You may not want to throw more people at the top of the funnel when the bottom of the funnel is still quite leaky. Okay, uh, advice on approaching marketing open source software. So this is um, a tough one because there's a real balance to strike because if you're selling a software product, at least, you can sort of get away with being a little bit marketing-y, with open source, they can't even be a drop of uh, marketing in there or salesy feeling in there. So really what I would suggest is focus on the community, focus on community building, connecting community members with each other to the extent possible, and then helpful content and guides um, would be my playbook there. All right, uh, Will asks, any tips for engaging developers and agencies and freelancers? So I'm guessing the sort of impetus for this question is much more if you have like an ISV model where you're getting agencies to sort of sell or build uh, your feature into other people's or into the customers. Is that kind of where it's stemming from? Okay, so well, then I would suggest um, thinking more about enablement or uh, like how do you help that developer or freelancer explain the value of your product in a really concise way? Like, put yourself in their shoes and say, what would be the easiest thing? Is it a couple of slide templates that I can put into a deck? Is it a one pager that makes this really clear? And how do you sell the value of them becoming experts in your technology and what that's going to enable them? Like, are you going to connect them with leads and potentially integration uh, contracts? That needs to be really, really clear. Um, Matt asks if I can speak to the role of business users and low coders in marketing at Retool. Uh, this is a bit of a misnomer because uh, Retool is actually more for uh, technical users than it may seem. Unlike other low-code platforms, you actually do need to know quite a fair bit of code uh, to get started and, and successful in Retool. But in terms of business users, I think um, one thing that's really interesting, Matt, at Stripe, it was really useful for us to actually play much more into the developer and technical centricity because business users, even CFOs, would come to us and say, yeah, I saw code on the homepage. Like, like I'm not going to be using it, but I know my developers are going to love it. So to the extent that you can kind of showcase the business value of developer friendliness, that might be the way to go. All right, Coleman, you're asking how technical to aim for, like, is this too complex? Um, I'm curious at, at your company at Slate, like how, who's the buying profile? Because again, uh, with developers, it's a huge audience and you can segment it in quite a few ways. Yeah, it's typically like um, someone in the, in the realm of data analyst, most likely kind of give, give, give or take. Yeah, um, so meet your customers where they are. So if you're talking to a data analyst, maybe you actually want to play down the technical aspects and play up some of the more things that they might be interested in, like the model schema or the query language or any sort of interesting bits that you're doing for them. So think about the practitioner, put yourself in their shoes. That'll be different for someone who's like a Kubernetes operator or a machine learning model generator or a data analyst. So the closer you can be to that customer persona, talk to them day in, day out, and really understand how they're talking about their problems, then your solutions can sort of meet them where they are. Uh, I realize because I'm going through these rapid fire, these are pretty shallow answers. So if you all ever want to chat, I'm just uh, critics at retool.com. I'll put that in here. Feel free to reach out. And I'm always happy to chat in more detail about your specific business or anything like that. Yeah. And feel free to ask follow-up questions as well. Uh, we do want to make sure that 
Krithika is a wealth of knowledge here. So we want to make sure that we answer the question for your uh, circumstances. You can fo put follow up in the chat, or if Krithika is answering your question, you can just raise your hand and we'll track that. Uh, Kirsten asks, if I'm beta testing messaging, what are my favorite questions to ask? Uh, this is not a plant. Kirsten is a PMM at Retool, and she does this better than most people I know. Um, but I would say that the thing that is very easy to ask is, can you explain what you read in the section? And so if they're speaking back at you and they say something that's wildly off from what you intended to communicate, that delta is always the easiest thing to, to come off of. Um, and then is there anything that was confusing? Or is there anything that you wanted to know or that you still have questions about that this page didn't answer? Uh, those three things usually get you to a uh, coalescing of the core issues or, or challenges of the page. Um, Hamna asks, any tips for writing strong outbound emails? Uh, I am not a subject line and outbound expert by any means. I tend to usually use very generic subject lines like hello from Stripe or hello from Retool and I throw in an emoji and they've actually gotten pretty surprisingly high open rates, uh, but your mileage may vary. I would highly recommend putting in a system where you can A-B test this. HubSpot does this really easily, Intercom as well. So uh, try it out, try out a bunch of different variants is what I would say. I would say subject lines has not been the most useful measure in terms of people actually converting through. That's always in the content. So the more useful and direct your content can be, that's been Helpful length definitely matters. Like I think a smaller email um, has led to higher conversions. But again, I'm, I'm not a huge expert in this and there's a lot more experts out on the internet on this one. Uh, Holly, you ask, what are the success metrics to evaluate content marketing? This is a tough one. Um, there is sort of similarly seed metrics and harvest metrics on this one, Holly. So seed metrics are did it spike on Hacker News or Twitter? Like, I think that's some of your biggest measures of virality and if developers really found the content useful. Uh, but that's sort of a short-term spike, right? Uh, what is more the long-term metric is what's, what's the cohorted growth in terms of views that that content is getting? So uh, for some of these sort of evergreen pieces of content or pillar content, you'll actually see like the week over week numbers kind of compound over time. And as you start creating a corpus of content, that has a much more exponential compounding effect. So I think instead of individual pieces, you want to focus on, did they hit? For the sort of collective, you want to focus on, did they increase traffic? Did they increase your SEO? The latest question is around for early startups, the range of use cases, should the marketing message be narrow or could they be more generic? This is the million dollar, billion dollar question, if you will. Um, my personal philosophy, and it may not be the right philosophy for every company, is that I like to kind of think about the TAM as concentric circles. So I personally like to start with kind of maximizing that inner concentric circle where you have the most product market fit and then starting to expand out. So for example, with Retool, we're starting with uh, changing how software is built for internal applications. We think that there's a huge TAM there, but it's still not like the TAM overall of software development in general. We started with internal tools and we expect to grow those concentric circles over time. I'll throw a question out there, but everyone feel free to keep putting things into the chat and feel free to ask something that's specific to your circumstance. I'm sure it, you won't be alone. It's common to everyone else. Um, Krithika, with all the hype about PLG products, when should a founder think about doing outbound like cold outreach or should they ever? When someone's already signed up for your product, you mean? No, just um, the outbound on LinkedIn. Oh, just in, out, I'm on LinkedIn, yeah. okay. Yeah. Well, there, there's a couple of things here. I think um, it actually really helps to start with folks who are already coming in inbound and start signing up for your, for your product. And what you can see there is, hey, maybe there's some signals within the product that tell me they're more likely to like need a committed sales contract. Um, you know, maybe they're adding a bunch of folks on their teams and they need the collaboration features or they look up your SSO documents and you kind of think, okay, this is probably an enterprise sale. You may not get that because not everyone signs up for accounts with their work email. So very hard to do lead scoring for, for most developer products, but you can through product signals kind of find that out. And what I found helpful is reaching out to those customers once they've already signed up and are playing with your product and see what resonates 
extract some of those messages, create some stem cell light of content, and then try to play that in a more outbound sense. So really learn what, what works before you try to go outbound and just um, you know throw some things against the wall and see what sticks. You will have a better hit rate if you already have validated some of that with customers who have come in and down. Um, Killian asks, not valuing their old time, the, the build versus buy cycle is always an underestimate, right? There's like, oh, I'll just throw it together in a weekend. And what do you mean? This is only going to take me half, a, half an afternoon. And so what I found helpful is just like articulating all of the details. So here's one that we did for Stripe um, called a guide to becoming a payment facilitator. Now, for those who aren't familiar with becoming payment facilitators, you probably never want to become familiar with this. But what we did was we went into all of the details of all of the work that it takes and um, did a comparison chart where it goes into the, uh, sorry, I kind of linked into this quite deep, but if you scroll back up the page, it gets into the details of um, what the costs are to actually set this up. So. There's a section called timeline and cost that I'll link to instead. But articulating that and just making it super clear, like where the cost and the time is going to come from, oftentimes it'll spark for developer like, oh yeah, I, I didn't think about that. Or, oh yeah, there's the maintenance cost. Or, oh yeah, there's the bug fixing cost. Or if someone comes in with an additional feature request, what, who's going to handle that? It's not just a hackathon project that you could ship and forget. It takes time to do this sort of analysis, by the way, so bake that in, but as long as you can be realistic and not sandbag or over, uh, over inflate it either, like you just want to be realistic with developers. All right, another question from Kristen. Um, in terms of striking a balance between the business value and the features, I would say with developers specifically, if they're your audience, focus more on the features than you would on the benefits. The benefit should almost be like the um, amalgamation or sort of the, the gestalt that they take away from it rather than something that you're being overly explicit about. I think this usually works very nicely if you just like bucket your features into major headings and those headings can be your benefits but you don't have to do purely benefits-based selling. That's usually something that's much more helpful to do in your sales materials because you wanna be selling the value and above the line um, versus going deep into features in the first couple of calls. Uh, I see a raised hand, please go ahead, unmute. All right, thank you for your time. Uh, my question regarding uh, when you sell to a developer organization, uh, I just wanna learn, learn from your experience where you wanna sell the product, where there's something brand new, there's a vacuum on the data, on the stack versus you're selling on a, a spectral product doing something better compared to the existing you know, technology or so. So just learning you know, which one uh, uh, which one works better and on which conditions. So thank you. Um, that sounds like an entire course at HBS. <laughs> uh, but I think like figuring out whether you want to build a net new category, I will say, it's always easy to underestimate what category creation actually takes. It takes years of investment and effort and oftentimes can be really uh, backfired, like it may not go well. Um, I, I hate to name names, but DocuSign is sort of a famous example of this where they went into a category of digital transaction management and had to actually pair a lot of that messaging back because their customers were coming to their website and saying, where's my e-signature? And so you also want to kind of understand where the market is and be maybe six months ahead of the market, not six years above ahead of the market. And so to the extent that you're building something net new, try to find potentially the, um, the few companies that are more early adopters who like to try new technologies and maybe that's helpful to you know, their careers as well because they can be some of the early folks that are really championing that or being known for that. Um, that was sort of in, in Stripe's view, that was super helpful because for the companies like, uh, a John Deere, one of the things that they really wanted to be known for is their, uh, is their new focus and renewed focus on technology. And so they're much more amenable to like implementing some of Stripe's features, even though we were still not super enterprise ready at the time that we engaged them. 
Um, but when it comes to a better mousetrap, that's also a hard challenge because you're telling people to rip something out uh, that they might already have in place and put this in instead. And so the sort of switch to X kind of playbook is much more around what is going to get them moving off of that inertia. Is it an industry dynamic, like a regulatory change? Is it a new feature that's not available on the old staff? Like you kind of have to figure out your hooks and the carrots to get people to migrate rather than um because because otherwise they won't so you have to be really careful in your marketing there thank you uh vivek asks in terms of building engagement and belonging from developers in their community um i agree with you you don't want to inundate developers you don't want to annoy them message them i think this is being more about like the helpful watering hole so when they do have a question they kind of see that other people who have questions are getting them answered they're seeing engagement when someone posts something that other people are also posting something. So in the retool community, for example, we have a playbook where we kind of usually wait for 12 hours. And if we don't see a post getting engagement, we'll kind of come in with our own employees uh, responding to those conversations. But for the most part, we like to facilitate communication between developers um, who are not a retool first. So they might be small dynamics like that, Vivek, that you might want to consider, but um, yeah, my, my strong feeling very much aligned with your instincts of not using that as a marketing channel primarily. Frederick, can you um, can you tell me a little bit more about the channels that you were thinking about when you asked this question? Uh, hi, yeah, my internet's bad, so this might break up. But um, yeah, basically we have like, SEO content is working really well. And uh, I have one uh, marketer who's kind of owning that and working with agency and that's working great. And now I just feel like there's this like dizzying array of potential other things that we could do to complement that. And I'm kind of trying to figure out the kind of like headcount model and kind of like strategic plan of what to try. And I'm a bit like, do we try and go really deep into one thing? Do we try shallow on a bunch of things? Like, yeah, outbound could be one, events could be one, you know. So yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, it's a very high level question. So yeah, it's, a, it's a really good one. It's very top of mind for us here at Retool, and actually, my team will will laugh because I see this all the time. But at a company with high ambitions of growth and scale, and if you want to grow at a, a really fast pace and an accelerated pace. You cannot just build one engine and jump on it and optimize the heck out of it and expect that to drive results. You have to let that train go down the tracks and start building the next four engines. So my, um, again, this is my two cents, but I would urge you to experiment shallowly with a bunch of different channels, see if any of them strike and then invest in that, building that into a program. So think like a projects to programs mindset. So start as projects, if they work, make them programs. If not, decommission them and move on to the next. Uh, I would say probably give it a quarter to really mature. You talk about stem cell line of content a lot as a concept. What do you mean by that? Yeah, what I mean by that is um, I'm a big believer in consistency, consistency across channels, consistency in how you message, consistency in how you talk about products. but. I'm also very mindful that different channels um, may need different things. So for example, at Retool, we're, we're launching a new product pretty soon, and it's going to apply to net new customers as well as existing customers. And you may want to really translate that message and make it quite different for those two different types of audiences. So what I mean by stem cell line is you have a core messaging doc that talks about the key features that you want to highlight, the key benefits that you want to get across, the key proof points that make that come to life. But then you translate them and you use that messaging in different formats. Like your blog post may look just a little bit different. Your press release may look a little bit different. Your emails may look a little bit different. Uh, Frederick, uh, on your follow-up question, I would say for the projects, try to do that as scrappily as possible with the folks you already have in-house rather than taking a bet by hiring somebody. I think contractors and agencies are great for this as well when you're still in the project phase. And then once you kind of see that hit as a program, hire in-house. Awesome. If anyone had any last questions, now is your chance. All right. 
Well, thanks folks, you're a fantastic audience. Thanks for all the questions. And as I said, please feel free to reach out if there's other questions that you have. I'm in the Dev Founders Slack as well. Thank you so much, Krithika. This is wonderful, learned a lot, and I'm sure everyone have learned a lot as well. Thank you for sharing this hour with us and thank you everyone for, for joining.